Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. <laughs> oh, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you Lord, for another day, Lord. We do pray for all of our members who are traveling or who are sick, who have other issues, uh, financial issues and, and uh, all the rest of it, Lord. There's so many things that this world demands of us. Um, and sometimes we just get overloaded. So, <coughs> excuse me. Father, I know that you have all of us in mind. You're protecting all of us. I ask that you bless all those who love you. Forgive us all our sins, Lord, and come now. The world is getting so totally silly. Uh, come now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, the book of Hebrews certainly uh, tells us that Christ is above everything. He's above the law. He's above Moses. Uh, he's above the temple and so on. And many places in Scripture we have the, the uh, supremacy of Christ. But there's a place that people don't look at so much for that necessarily. And it's in, found in Matthew chapter 12. I want to talk to you about that a little bit today. Uh, and go, go turn with me please to chapter 12 of the book of Matthew. We get Christ's own words, of course, and his own admonitions and, and so forth. And the whole, the whole discourse is, you know, the, the Pharisees are talking to him and, they, and they're denying him and their hearts are evil as can be. I mean, evil, they, they are devising murder in chapter 11 and forward. And so uh, and Christ is responding to them. You know, I, I want to start actually with the end of 11. 28, 29, and 30. Come to me, all you labor, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, we, the world has made much of, of that scripture, uh, those scriptures. Uh, as far as Ellis Island is concerned, you know, the Statue of Liberty, you know, I'll come to America. But this has nothing to do with that. They totally misuse that when they say these things, as if America could burden or lighten the burden on anyone. Uh, all uh, immigrants that come here, uh, if they're honest, and then, you know, some will look past that and say they're glad they're here, and, and that's fine. Uh, but they all had to do exactly what everybody else has to do. Those are already living here and, and, and otherwise, and that is to work hard. Work hard, do what you got to do, do the right thing to make, a to make a life, to make a living. It really is not much different from anywhere else on earth, except for the fact that we do have, uh, that were afforded us freedoms that many places in the world did not have, and thank God for that. Uh, but to turn it into anything else is really a, a, a problem. So with that in, in, in a little background there, what we're really talking about here, uh, what Christ is talking about here, and what the biblical writers uh, were essentially a chad or one with, and that's regarding the truth that man is dependent on God's mercy and his grace in Christ for all spiritual knowledge. That's really what, it's, what, what, this, what this scripture is saying. Take my yoke is a Jewish metaphor for discipleship and discipline. In other words, put your neck under my yoke and receive instruction is what that means. And if the yoke is light, that means it's an easy yoke. It's a yoke that you should want to be under. You should want to be under Christ's yoke because there you receive instruction. And what you receive instruction concerning is eternal life and freedom and this freedom <coughs> that he just spoke of you know come to me all you were heavy laden and so on uh, has to do with spiritual experience uh, someone has said Christ alone is the teacher who by his person can instruct men regarding the father and bring them the rest of soul which is the very essence of true spiritual experience a rest involving removal of sin's guilt 
and the possession of eternal life. That's what it means to take my yoke upon, come, you know, come all you who are heavy laden. That's what that means. It has nothing to do with coming to another country on this planet. It has to do with spiritual freedom to know that you're saved, okay? Turn with me to Colossians 2.16 quickly. We'll go there just once. We're going to stay in Matthew pretty much the whole time here, but uh, Colossians 2.16 Well, no, I don't want to go there yet. Don't go there yet. I got ahead of myself here. A few notes I took. I don't, notes are okay, and I use them a lot, but I'd rather just say as the Lord gives it to me, you know. Uh, let's read here. Follow with me, please. Uh, 12, 1 and following. So he's telling him this. He's telling him how to get spiritual freedom, uh, and also, by way of reminder, in uh, uh, chapter 11, he's, he pronounces some woes on some places that did not repent. The whole thing is about repentance. If you don't repent, there are big problems. If you repent, it would be, you would, in other words, come under his yoke where you can receive instruction and receive that instruction in a way that will never leave you because you can then believe after that. Once you repent, you believe. Once you believe, you are set free. Hallelujah. How many of you like to be free? Amen. How many of you like to know that you're saved? Amen. Yes. Uh, 1 John 5, 13. Exactly. We need all the help we can get. 1 John 5, 13 says, I've written these things to you, little children, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you have eternal life. And so all those who claim, well, we can't really know if we're saved or not, is ridiculous. I can't know that you are, and you can't know that I am, although we, we have a good idea, but we can be confident in those things with each other. But only you can know for your sure, because you know your heart as far as, uh, uh, you know, God knows your heart, but you know your heart too. You know what you really believe, in other words, okay? And I know what I believe. And so that's what sets us free, then that knowing without experiential knowledge, and I like the way of the, this quote I read you, uh, the very essence of spiritual experience. Today, the, the modern church, so-called, the uh, evangelical, new evangelicalism and movements like that, the emergent church, certainly, uh, everybody's driving together, and they all want to have a spiritual experience. They want to experience God, and so they walk the labyrinth, and they do all this mumbo-jumbo pagan nonsense, really, that the Bible actually condemns. But that's what they're doing to find their spiritual experience when the spiritual experience is nothing more, certainly nothing less, than the knowing that you're saved. That's the experience, okay? And how can we know? Because God cannot lie. He's not a man. How can we know that we're saved? Because when God, God is the truth. I, you, your truth, Lord, is a path unto my, is a light, or your truth is a path, is a light to the path unto my feet. <laughs> Something close to that. And so when we have the truth of God, we have a walkway that we won't stumble because we see. We're not walking blindly. We don't have blind faith. There's no such thing. Blind faith is ridiculous. There's, there's no such thing. What we have is faith in God who is the truth. And therefore we rely on him. And when God says, you know you can be saved, believe it because you know you can be saved as much as you repent it. And so it all bases on repentance. You know, come to me. My yoke is easy and my burden is lightened. Or his light. So 12 and 1 following. And that time Jesus went through the grain fields on Sabbath. And his disciples were hungry. And began to plug heads of grain and eat. And when the Pharisees saw it. They said to him. Talking to Jesus. Look your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. First of all it was lawful. Even the, the Pharisees and the scribes understood that. If you have a need like hunger. The written law is put aside for the spirit of the law, okay? And, uh, and they were plucking, they weren't reaping, but they understood, or they looked at the plucking as if they were reaping. Reaping would be a job. I'm going out to reap the field. Well, they weren't doing that. They were just picking something to eat right then and there. They weren't doing a job to store it and to load it on wagons and such. But that's how it was interpreted by these guys who were evil in heart, who were trying to trip up Jesus and his disciples. So Jesus knows this, of course, and he says, verse 3, But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, 
nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest. The showbread by the law was dedicated as food for the priests. That was it. However, David had been chased around. He's running around the desert. He's looking for, he's desperate for food, he and his men, to keep everybody alive and, and healthy and invigorated. And he, and he had to do this. He said, and he knew this. He knew his God good enough and, more and, and, and strong enough. He understood that the Lord had no problem. There was food in the temple, and we're going to go get some. We're not going to leave the priests without anything to eat, but we're going to get it, and the priests will understand too. And best of all, and most of all, God will understand that we can eat this even though it was against the law. Hallelujah. And he gives him another example. Or have you not read, verse 5, or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Wow, how is that possible? Well, the priests had to perform the temple duties even on a Sabbath. The law says you can't work, but they were doing work, and yet they're blameless. And they knew this too, yet they were trying to blame Christ. We have people today trying to blame you and me for believing in this Christ and blaspheming Christ himself in all kinds of ways, and these guys are doing it. And that, by the way, is one of the most horrible things you can do, is to blaspheme Christ, because the power that Christ worked through was the Holy Spirit. And we'll get to that in a little bit. It is one of those, uh, the Holy Spirit, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, is, it is the unpardonable thing, the sin rather. When you see Christ, when you see a man doing miracles, and everything he did has already been written, and you read it and you see him, and you read it and you see him, and you still don't recognize him by choice, then you're guilty. Then you're guilty. Because he did everything he could possibly do. If Christ were all on earth today healing people, you know, talking to the leg that wasn't there, and here comes a new leg, and everybody would go, wow. Yeah, but that's what they do. They would still be guilty of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, which Jesus himself said will not be forgiven. Wow. So he gives them these examples. And then he says in verse 6, Yet you say that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Or yet I say, rather, in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Wow. Now go to Colossians 2.16. Paul makes it very clear here. And I like it. It's the only scripture you need for anyone that wants to come against you like the Seventh-day Adventists, like the Roman Catholics, and many others who are stuck. The Church, the, the church of Philadelphia, as they call themselves, they're all stuck on, on religion, this, you know, thinking. They're all stuck on legalism, and they want to still live in the Old Testament and yet take partake of the, of the New Testament. You cannot live by two covenants. When one covenant is established like the new one, then the old one, by that establishment of the new, has been obliterated, has been set aside, has, is no longer in working form, just like the law is no longer what regulates us. Rather, it is grace. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. 2.16 So let no one judge you in food or in drink. You can eat or drink what you want. Or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. The substances of Christ. Here again, these Pharisees knew not the substance. The substance is standing in front of them. You know, he's doing, he's preaching the word of God. He even evokes Isaiah here in a little bit. Uh, he talks about Jonah. We'll read about that too. And he talks about Solomon. He talks about the Queen of Sheba. We see all these things that he brings up. And yet they, and they know it's true because it's what the scriptures say. And they knew the scriptures. They just didn't choose to believe it. They just didn't choose to follow them to obey. We're talking evil to the max. For the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. 
Remember, I started out by saying Christ is bigger than everybody. And the book of Hebrews tells us that in many ways. But the book of Hebrews is really uh, an explanation of, of the law and what it means. Okay? And it's a technical book, as, such, as is the book of Romans that Paul wrote. It's a technical book. What Jesus here is saying in the Gospel of Matthew is not so much technical as just this is the way it is. So we look at it like this is the truth, this is a fact. Yes, it's technical too because, you know, the bloodlines and so on and God's timing and God's warnings and God's prophecies, all that technical business that lines up with the law and everything else God had said, those things are true technically, but they're also just true because Jesus said they would. Okay, Jesus said this is the way it is. And he went back to, techni or to the technical by saying, don't you know about, you know, what David did? Because it's written. You should know about this. See, so he proves what he is espousing. I love it. Now, when he had departed from there, verse 9, he went into the, their, their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might ac accuse him? They knew it was. They knew it was. Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? You know, there's a couple of thoughts on this one. The one is, of course, you would pull out an animal just because of the mercy of it. But these guys, being as evil as they were, they were part of the money chain. They're the ones who owned the money tables, and they were ripping people off on their sacrifices anyway. Oh, no, you can't bring that one. It's got a spot. I know you, don't, you can't see it, but right there's a spot. I'm the priest. You've you got to get rid of it. Here, I got one you can buy. That's what these guys were doing. So when Jesus said this to them, he's, he's not so much meaning that they were merciful. And that's why they would, even on a Sabbath, go through the work and pull out a sheep or whatever fell in the pit. It was because it, was, it would have been a loss of money. That sheep or that animal that fell in there represented money to them. It had a value. And that's the only reason these guys who were accusing him would have ever pulled it out. You see, it's a money thing. It's a mammon thing. And Christ knew this. These people are evil. When I speak of politicians being evil, it's the same kind of thing. They lie to us continually. They deny Christ continually. And I'm talking about the politicians that matter, the ones that actually have a voice, the ones, uh, you know, whose, uh, whose uh, doctrine, if you will, gets considered, gets passed into law, this kind of thing. I'm not talking about the the young, you know, junior senator or congressman who wants to change the world, you know, and they may be a Christian or whatever. There, there are a few of those here and there, but they don't get anything done. Okay, and if they know, if they know uh, anything at all, most of them get out before it's too late because they can't change the thing. It's an evil system. Look at 12. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? So God puts a value issue right on, right behind uh, accusing them of, yeah, you, you're going to pull your animal out if it falls because you value it, not because you're so merciful. <clears throat> Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So he's answering their question very directly. 13, then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees, not having enough, obviously, went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Isn't that interesting that these Pharisees were holding up the law of Moses, supposedly, and saying, oh, you can't work on the Sabbath? Yet they were working hard in their minds and by gathering, walking to a place and gathering to plot his murder on a Sabbath. What's up with that? That's what they were doing. They were plotting to murder him, which makes these guys murderers already because they had it here. In their hearts, they were already murderers. And there was no repentance in sight for these sad people. Very sad. To have God himself with you and know that he is, because he did everything he, he did, everything that the scriptures say. When this Messiah comes, he'll do da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. He'll heal sick, he'll set the captives, he'll do all this stuff. And the, the guy comes and he does it all. And no one else can do it. That's also recognized. No one can do it. But this guy, wow, how's he doing it? Must be God. And the, the normal people, the regular Joe and Jane, if you will, knew this. And even some Pharisees like Nicodemus, you know, came to him at night. Some of them understood. 
But the ones who were really in charge, like I said about these politicians of ours, the ones who were really in charge and were really making the rules and regulations, the ones that everybody was afraid of, denied him because they were murderers in their heart. They were evil to the max. Evil. Never forget it. I, I, you know, I get chided from people sometimes. Well, you know, you call them evil. I wouldn't go that far. Well, how far would you go? How far would you go to accuse a murderer and lying scum? How far you go? What do you say? Well, you're almost evil. You're evil with a little sugar on top. Either you're evil or you're not. And these guys are murderers. They're evil. We have these people today. Every one of our leaders in the world are evil. In the context which I already explained. This is why it's a satanic antichrist system. They cannot be but evil. <laughs> you can't stay in, in, in a high office for, for you know, years and years like Putin, like Merkel, like others. You can't, you can't be in there. Obama, Clinton, all the rest, the same. Wow. So they plotted to destroy him, verse 15, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. He just got out, he just got away. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. See, the bunch of people believed in him. Bunch of people knew this was the Holy Spirit. They're being healed by God. Yet he warned them not to make him known. See, it wasn't his time yet. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and here's where he, where the prophet Isaiah is brought into view. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. Hallelujah. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. That's referring to he will not be a political rabble rouser. He will not, you know, want to gain votes for himself. He will not go, vote for me and I'll set you free. He won't do that. He's not going to do that because that's what evil people do. A bruised reed he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench. Anyone who's weak, anyone who's, uh, you know, who can't really uh, look out for themselves, he's not going to end them. He's not going to take advantage of any of that. Till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name Gentiles will trust. This is meaning this teaching by Isaiah is that it's going to go beyond Israel, folks. When God sends his man, Jesus the Christ, his Messiah, Mashiach, he's going to go beyond Israel. The Gentiles will trust him. And what a slap that is to these Pharisees who were Jewish, you know. We have this today in many uh, Jewish circles. And of course we have the same nonsense in Gentile circles as in Calvinism, as in replacement theology people, which includes that. Unbelievable. 22, then one was brought to him who was a demon, who was demon possessed and blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? You know, the prophesied one. Now, when the Pharisees heard, heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Here are demon-filled people saying this, by the way. <laughs> but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Unless you have unity in plurality, unless you have echad with your, with your spouse, with your children, unless you have echad, with, uh, with uh, those around you, like in church, a church meeting, you cannot stand, it will not last, there's no power there, there's, no, there's just no, no, nothing to stand with, nothing to stand with. You and I cannot be, you've heard the term, no man is an island, well that has a lot of truth to it, because when you're by yourself, you're like a single cord, but a two or three cords are hard to break, the Bible says. 
Okay, and this is why the union of husband and wife is an important thing because that one is strong and Satan can do anything he wants. He will not get past that. He will not get past that. Hallelujah. So they call him son of David. The Pharisees don't like it. 25, but Jesus, again, he, he knew their thoughts and he said to them, every kingdom divided must fall. He says in 26, if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by, by Beelzebub, the Satan or the devil, by whom do your sons cast them out? Because of, he's already given the, his disciples to do that. Therefore they shall be your judges. Wow. Is everybody who casts out a devil from the devil? That don't make any sense. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come to you. Wow, but if it's really God that you're talking about and not Satan, the kingdom of God is here. And they knew that implication. They knew his implication, and they didn't like it. Because if the kingdom of God is here, it would make an end of their own rule. You know, he goes in there with a whip in the temple court. <laughs> And he turns over the table to the money changers. All of that was an expression of the kingdom of God is here. And you guys are evil. Look what you're doing. It's profit, profit, profit for you and nothing else. You're sending people to hell by, by selling them tickets to, to heaven. Yeah, you're sending them to hell because you don't allow certain things. You cast people out of the temple if they go against your, your, your criminal, vicious, evil uh, you know, ideas then suddenly they're no longer Jews. They're no longer God's people because you throw them out of the temple. You are evil to the core. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, that's a fact. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods? Unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his goods. Well, the strong man here is Satan. The house is the place where he has authority and his goods are his demons. So Christ comes down, he enters the, 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 uh, the sphere of Satan and he defeats him and he binds Satan. And to every believer, Satan is bound. Satan is free, he's still the prince of the power of the air to do what he wants with unbelievers until they become believers. Then he can't no longer do whatever he wants. Resist the devil and he will flee, we're told in James. Resist him. That's all you got to do. You don't have to command him. You don't have to, you know, oh, Satan, oh, God, get Satan off me. None of that. You don't have to pray about that because it's already done. That's what the cross did. It gave us a victory. That's why it's good news. Hallelujah. We resist him. When he puts something in your head that you know is not right and not biblical and goes against God, you just don't do it. You resist it. And then he has to go. Will he come back? Yeah, because he looks for an opportune time. When you are weak, when you may not resist it, but your job and mine is to continue to resist, just like it is to continue to knock, seek, and ask, and believe. Until this time is over, it ain't over for us. Until we are in eternity, the forever now, it ain't over for us. That's right. Verse 30. He who is not with me is against me. No offense. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. If you don't gather with him, then you're, then you're wasting all, all the word. You're wasting the truth of God. It's, it's, it's like seed just going like that. You don't have any purpose to put seed in its rows in the place where it'll grow up. You just sort of spread it out there so it will get lost, watered down, and burned up by the sun, possibly. He who is not with me is against me. Wow. Everyone who denies Christ today... All the naysayers, all the so-called, you know, apologists for science and, and Islam and, and all the rest of it, they are all in the same boat. They are against him. 
There are those, and you may have run into those that you work with or you're acquainted with that say, well, it's not that I'm against him, I'm just not for him. That's a, that's a silly thing. You must be for him or you are against him. Not being for him means you're against him. Christ himself said it. It doesn't get any clearer than that. And he says this, Therefore, because that's true, if you're not for me, you're against me. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come, and that's the millennial age. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. It's either or. Come to me or don't come to me. You know, either be hot or cold, Jesus says in Revelation. This mixture, this lukewarm, this, 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 this playing a game doesn't cut it with God. Nowhere. And people always say, well, you see things black and white. Well, what does this sound like? Gray? <laughs> Either be hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm. Either be black or white, don't be gray. Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't have nothing to do with evil. Just keep the knowledge of good, because you can't handle this other thing. If you do, you're going to die. No mixture. In the, in the Old Testament, the Jews were ordered, commanded, not to wear clothing made of Say silk and cotton. You can't weave the two together. Let it be cotton, let it be silk, but don't weave them together. Now, the weaving together of clothing with different materials isn't the problem. He was teaching them, God was, don't mix. Don't mix with the world. Don't mix with, with the devil. Don't mix anything. Keep the truth the truth. That's what he's saying. Keep it alone. Keep it alive. Keep it separated. And therefore, we are holy. If we are holy, then we'll separate from the world. We'll separate from the whole mentality that the world wants to shove on us and does shove on us. Wow, the Holy Spirit. See, it's the Holy Spirit. Why is he given preeminence here as far as you, you, can, you can say something ugly about Dad, you can say something ugly about the Son, but you better not say something ugly about the Holy Spirit. Wow. Holy Spirit is God like the Father and the Son in equality in the Achad of the Trinity. But he's also the one who actually gets things done. It's the Holy Spirit who brooded over the earth. And yet we're told Christ is the creator. Wow. God spoke and it was. Make sure the Holy Spirit is directing you every thought, every word, and every deed. Because if it's not him, it's not some fence-sitting little guy, it's the other spirit. This is why thoughts do not come to us from our own brains even. Our no, brains are not capable of making thoughts. They come from one place or the other, either God or the devil. We decide which one we're going to go with. So either make the tree good and its fruit good, because a good tree will produce good fruit, or a bad tree, because a bad tree will produce bad fruit. You know, in Revelation we also read... Uh, let the filthy be filthy still. And let the righteous be righteous still. In other words, they're going to make a choice. Leave them alone. They must make the choice. You cannot try to get somebody who's filthy and try to wash them up when they don't want to be washed. We do this with our children, and rightly so, because we love them. But ultimately, ultimately, they got to get clean themselves with God. Just like you had to get clean outside of your own parents. Just like I had to get clean outside of my own parents. Then he calls them exactly who they are. Brood of vipers, verse 34. How can you, being evil, <laughs> speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks... 
So he's saying their heart is nothing but evil because they only speak evil. And if you only speak evil, then you're only going to do evil. And he don't mince words. He says they're evil. They're not just off. They're not just backslidden. These weren't, see, these weren't backslidden leaders of Israel's law. These were evil people who didn't even consider the law, except in how they could use it to scare others to give them a profit. That's all they did. You're out of the temple. Look what the Catholic Church has done for centuries. We'll excommunicate you. You eat meat on Friday, you'll be excommunicated. You don't come to church and pay your regular tithe, you'll be excommunicated. You don't obey the pastor or the, the priest or whatever, you'll be excommunicated. That's what, they, that's what they did. This is why the Bible is clear. The only one who can be so-called excommunicated out of the church is for blasphemy and fornication. That's the only two reasons. Legitimate. Not this other nonsense that everybody else is doing. Wow. Jesus says in 35, a good man of the good treasure of his heart, everything in his heart is right, brings forth good things. How can it be anything else? <laughs> wow. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Look how elementary Jesus takes this to say it to them. There's no simpler way to say to them, you are evil. You can turn if you repent. If you go back to chapter 11, Pharisees, <laughs> <laughs> and if you take my yoke, and if you sit under it, and if you learn, if you allow yourself to be taught by me, Christ, the logos of which they already knew because they had the scriptures. Wow. But I say to you, 36, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. And listen to this. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This is a judicial teaching. If you have ugly words, they're going to say enough about you at judgment day, excuse me, judgment day to convict you or condemn you. I mean, to, 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 to condemn you or to set you free. One or the other. Again, there's no middle ground. This is why there's the great white throne. And this is why there's the bima. And we know what that is, right? Bima is for rewards. Great white throne is your lot in the lake of fire. There's no middle ground here. And if you live a life, ugly life, and you never repent it, that has already proven your end result. If you're a Christian and you speak ugly and you don't get repentance from that, you're going to lose rewards. Because Christ already paid for your soul. Please understand the difference. And I know many Christians who speak ugly words from time to time, uh, including yours truly. But I also get repentance because I know this, and I've taught this, and I'll say it again. The successful Christian life is a life without unrepented sins. Repent of everything every day, just, just in case that you may have been wrong. Even when we felt so right, so justified, you know, da da da, da so and so, blah blah blah, this and that, just repent. And he gives some really interesting, uh, you know, things here. An evil, or let's go back to 38. After he said, by your words you'll be condemned or, or set free or justified. Then some of the Pharisees and uh, scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. See, he's convicting them so much that they know they're evil. Now they say, well, maybe you should show us a sign. As if he had to give them a sign. And he is the sign, is the point. How, how is the sign, the sign, how is the sign going to show some sign? You know, it's ridiculous. And he says this to answer, but he, said, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
So we have evil adulterers, evil because their hearts are evil, they speak evil, they plot murder, even on the Sabbath, and they're adulterers because they're not really following the laws of Moses. They're adulterers because they have spiritual fornication going on because they have themselves that they're are really lifting up as gods and their wealth and their mammon. So they are adulterers to God. Spiritual fornication is, is always uh, worshiping something other than God himself, in this case, themselves and their mammon. So he was right in saying, and he was right on the money in saying, and evil and adulterers, not just evil, that would have been understood enough, I think. But he said evil and adulterers on top of that. And look at, man, I've heard debate, you know, several debates and all kinds of commentaries on, on the silliness of Jonah and the fish that people who believe that are just, are just stupid. Well, look what they're doing. They're blaspheming Jesus because he obviously believed in Jonah. Look at 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He didn't say it was a metaphor. He said there was a Jonah, there was a great fish, and Jonah was in the belly of that great fish. That's all there is to it. And in like manner, I will be in the earth, or the Son of Man, which he's talking about himself, will be in the earth for three days and, th and uh, three nights. Wow. And then he tells him again, just like he did previously, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented and the, at the pre preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. I told you at the beginning that this talks about how Jesus is greater than. I'll list them for you towards the end. But here's one of them. We've already gone over a few. A greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The queen of Sheba came from the south at great expense to herself and at great travail, I'm sure, even though she was comfy with all the, her servants and attendants, a trip like that is not easy, <coughs> especially back then, even though she may have been carried on people's shoulders or however they did that. And she was a Gentile, and a Gentile will judge you Jews who are evil in the day of judgment. She came all the way to see Sol or Solomon, and to inquire of him and his God and was totally impressed by even his servants. And here I, God himself, come down to you in your little neighborhood and you don't do anything for me but blaspheme me. That's what he's saying. You don't recognize the one who saves you. Isn't that amazing how God has so many examples of those who did honor him, who did praise him, who did go through personal sacrifice to honor him. And there's an example in 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and he finds none. Nothing to rejuvenate him, nothing to crank him back up. So he says, you know what, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. But notice that it's empty. Nothing has taken the place of that. We're talking about a, the body of a human being here. Once a devil leaves, like some of those people who got the devil cast out of them by Christ, if they did not replace that with Christ, then they had a clean place and the devil could come back any time. And that's what this demon is doing. This demon says to himself, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Wow. To operate in this space-time dimension, the devil has to have, uh, besides influence, influence is one thing, but if he's going to operate and do things, uh, 
then he has to have a body to operate in. A body looks like the snake gave him or the serpent gave him in the garden. He spoke to Eve from the body of a serpent. All the murderers, mass murderers, all the evil people on earth that act out things have some sort of devil in them because they cannot get it done. A devil cannot murder somebody by an idea except they find this person so weak that he, he or she will off themselves, talk them into suicide, this sort of thing. He tried it with Christ. Oh, just, just go ahead and jump off this, 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 this temple. Because, you know, the angels will catch you unless you dash your foot against, you know, this kind of thing. He was tempting God. And he tempts many people and they just find life unbearable and so they off themselves. A lot of times this is the only way. If that's not the case or a similar situation that might occur, then he has to inhabit a body and control that body to pull the trigger, to start a war, to do whatever. You know, when I read to you the the uh, on last Wednesdays the uh, the oath of the Jesuits and all the awful things in there how, how would you get that done see that's how that that's Satan getting it done through people and willingly total willingness giving it up all the way talk about evil evil and fornicators so Nineveh or Nineveh Nineveh is excused because they repented at Jonah's preaching. That's that generation, the later generation, God had to punish them because they didn't repent. But that generation that Jonah preached to repented. The, and a greater than Jonah. The queen of south comes to hear from Solomon and a greater than Solomon is here. <laughs> Verse 45 then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. They're going to have a party in this person. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with the wicked generation. It's not going to get better for them. It's going to get much worse. And the only thing that we do sometimes, we think of worse as in, Everything that's around, well, it's bad if you don't have a job. It's bad if you're sick. You know, it's bad if your house is falling down and you, you don't have any money or energy or to fix it. And, and it's bad as your car breaks. You know, these kind of things. We think those things. But the worst is in a spiritual relationship here. Besides those things here on earth. It'd be far worse of a person to having gotten rid of a devil who now comes back because God wasn't replacing that devil in this guy's heart. And now this devil comes and he takes other devils with him. We heard of the demoniac, right, that Jesus set free. He had legion in him. A legion, if we take the Roman legion, and if that's what was meant, and I'm pretty sure it was, then he had 2,000 devils in him. A legion was about 2,000 uh, soldiers. That's a lot of devils. And see, here's where we got to go. How does that work? I don't know. The spirit world isn't confined by space-time dimension. Verse 46, And while he, Jesus, was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brother stood outside, seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, seeking to speak to you. And look what he says. He doesn't say, Oh, Holy Mary, Oh, let her in immediately. Make way for my mother and my brothers. Oh, I want to talk to my mother Mary. She's co-redemptive with me, you know. He doesn't say any of that trash that the Roman Catholics say. Look what he says. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? One would think that he was discourteous. One would think that, wow, that's rude, Jesus. Come on, your mom is out there. Didn't she, you know, love on you? Didn't she breastfeed you? Didn't she change your diaper and all that? Didn't she teach you some things? Come on, let her in. If not the brothers, let her in. But again, he's giving a spiritual lesson. He's saying, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. In other words, this is my family. Remember the scripture where he tells us elsewhere, if you love 
your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife more than me, you're not worthy of me? That's what this is tying in with. We have a hard time doing this, you know, and, and much of it is emotionalism. And this, again, goes back to this intelligent love. I dare say the... And there, and there seems to be no, no way to help these people, really. The misunderstanding of love and, and all these basics, you know, of time and eternity and this taking on my yoke and all these things... It's, it's been around. I didn't just come out with this and God didn't give me some, some special thing, you know, this week to, to, to study up on and give me some revelation. This has been known by students of the Bible ever since the Bible was, was published. It's God's truth, but it's not taught, is it? For the majority, it's just not taught. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, verse 50, last verse, is my brother and sister and mother. Right there it is. Does that leave doubt as to who is his mother? Oh, Mary, the mother of God. God doesn't have a mother. Why? He has no beginning. He has no end. God just is. So how dare someone make a religion out of it? The mother of God. Makes me sick. I just want to slap somebody when I hear that. Mm -hmm. Then I repent. But then immediately when I hear it again, I want to choke him. <laughs> then I repent. And then I hear it again and I want to kick him upside the head. <laughs> and I repent. And then I hear it again and I want to beat him with a stick. <laughs> You know, he just go, keeps on going. I got to repent because it's so stupid. And then mother church. Are you kidding me? There is no mother church. There's only Father God and Christ ahead of that church. And all people have to do is put his yoke on them. Put themselves under the yoke Oh, teach me, Lord. This is great. I'm not even in pain. I thought this might hurt, but it don't hurt. This is great. Wow, I didn't know that. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, wow, I've just been set free. I was wrong about that, too. That's kind of how it, how it is. You know, you just put yourself under the yoke, meaning you pray, you get the word, and you spend time. This is how you have a relationship. You spend time with the Word of God. And then you know, and the Bible says very clearly, those who have this, more will be given. And those who have not, even the little they may have is taken away. Why? Satan comes immediately and takes it away. Mark 4, 4. The Word is sown. You know, good ground, shallow ground, dry ground and all that, rocky ground. And good ground means they get more, 30, 60, 100 fold. Isn't that amazing? And these guys had the word proclaiming, these Pharisees that is, proclaiming they were following the word, wearing the robe, standing on a corner, dig me, I'm a Pharisee. Don't cross me because I got power. I'll excommunicate you. Don't tell me there's no blemish on that lamb of yours. I'm the Pharisee. I say it's got blemishes. Buy one of mine. And Gentiles have done just what Jews have done. And Jews have done just what Gentiles have done. A generation has a remnant. And then they die off. And you have a few trickle through. But basically it goes downhill until God sends a revival, usually through persecution. And then they go, God, we need you. And then we come to God, and you got a few who are real, and you start to cycle over and over, and that's where we are today. And that's why I admonish all of you all the time to you know, stay in the Word, uh, defend the Word, and the only way we can defend it is to know it. I don't mean we got to all be theologians in the, in the sense that we got to know every little thing about it. No one does. 
Many theologians are totally wrong. Many theologians are uh, Calvinists at heart, which is an evil teaching. Completely evil and adulterous. They have the wrong Jesus, just like the Catholics. They have the wrong salvation, just like the Catholics. And wrong everything else. Total wrong. And they're leading people to hell as much as any other false teaching. It's unbelievable. So, in this 12th chapter, <coughs> Matthew readily reviews Christ's many names and offices. He's the Son of Man. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is my servant that came out of Isaiah and my beloved. He is the son of David. He is greater than the temple, greater than Jonas, greater than Solomon. Wow. All of that in the chapter. And then, when, like I said earlier, when you go to Hebrews, you get the, the technical, biblical truth of all of that even further, you see. He's, he's, he's above the law, above angels. Hallelujah. About, you know... Uh, I like to believe in Jesus, but an angel came and told me something else last night in the dream. Well, then you're sad and ate up. You better get rid of that thing, because you know that was the devil. Because Christ is above that. Wow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Without your word, we'd all be lost. Not only the word that became flesh that died on a cruel cross. But the written word, the logos, that we can read and study to know your mind, to ascertain your will, to differentiate between good and evil, is only possible because you gave us the written word. And that we only learn it from you, who is the teacher, by the Holy Spirit which empowers us to understand and come to believe. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Be with all the persecuted church, the ones who have a hard, hard time. And I'm not even asking you to knock off the, the bad times because you obviously put it on them and you know what they need. All of us are being tested in various ways. I just know that you test for advancement, and I thank you for that. Cause us to go through every test, however ugly it may seem to us on the surface, and make it out the other end absolutely with a smile on our face, the glory of God, of yourself all over us, brightly shining, and the devil defeated, and all his demons, who is a liar and a loser. Thank you, Jesus, for gaining the victory for us on the cross. In your holy name I pray. Amen.